So turn in your Bible to back to Philippians chapter 2. And I want to focus in on verses 6 through 8, but I want to include verse 5 as we begin. You know that verse, don't you? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We want to look in verses 6 through 8 and see how does Jesus think? How does Jesus think? Because our natural human way of thinking is messed up. It really is. And if we as a people are ever going to fulfill the purpose for which God made us, it's going to require a major change in our thinking. Did you know that the word repentance is a word that literally means to change the mind or to change your thinking? And so that's, that's what we need. We need a change of mind from our mind to the mind of Christ. And when that happens, it becomes evident in the direction of your entire life. As I said this morning, self-interest Self-centeredness is really the essence of, of sin. It's that attitude, well, what's in it for me? That self-centered thinking has to change. And we need to begin to think like Jesus. So how does Jesus think? Well, <laughs> a lot different than the way you and I think. And that's what we want to focus in on. As we read these verses this afternoon, follow along as I begin in verse 6, talking about Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, that is, who himself was God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, that is, though he was God, he did not see clinging to his deity as something that he had to do in coming to this earth. Verse 7, so he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of literally a slave and was made in the likeness of men. You know what I've said, and not originally with me, but it's amazing that God made human beings in his image. But you know what's even more amazing to me? That God himself was made in the image of man. That's what we're told here happened in verse 7. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Well, let's pause and pray, and then let's look at this. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus, this visible manifestation of you we want to know what you're like father we just look at jesus he is the expose of the father the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth we pray today that as we look at these verses help us to see how jesus thinks when we see what he did here we'll get a good indication of how Jesus thinks. And then would you replicate that kind of thinking in us? Because that's what you tell us. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So repl replicate, duplicate the mind of Christ, the mind of our Messiah Jesus in us, we pray, that he might be exalted through our lives because that's what our lives are supposed to be about. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. So I want to look at this two ways. I want us to look at verses 6 to 8 and see Jesus' mind, and then I want to apply that to our mind, your mind, and mine. In those verses that we just read, verses 6 to 8, we really see how Jesus functioned when he lived on this earth. Well, how did he function? Well, there's two parts of how Jesus functioned on this earth. The first part is, he would say, not I. 
that surrender. And then he would say, but the Father, that's dependence. Two parts to the way Jesus lived his life on this earth. Not I, but the Father. Surrender to the Father, dependence upon the Father. Let's look at those two parts. The first one where he says, not I, that surrender of himself, of his life, his earthly life to the Father, is revealed in two ways. Because when he said, not I, but the Father, he also said, not my will. We often see that uh, in its full bloom there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, under the burden and pressure of the sins of the world that he's dealing with in agony. If it be possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. He knew it wasn't. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will is part of what Jesus meant when he said, not I, not my will. And I want to chase this through quickly in a couple of uh, passages. John's gospel shows more of not to I, but the Father than probably any of the gospels. And in John chapter 5 and in verse 30, Jesus says, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. Not I, not my will. In chapter 6 and verse 38, very similar. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Chapter 7 and uh, verse 28, Jesus says to uh, those in the temple, you both know me, you know whence I am. I'm not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. In chapter 8 and verse 42, Jesus says, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me, in verse 50, and I seek not mine own glory, there is one that seeketh and judgeth. And so very clearly, when Jesus says, not, uh, not I, but the Father, when he says not I, he is surrendering his will to his heavenly Father. But not only is he surrendering his will, he's surrendering his power. Remember, he is God, right? He's surrendering his power or his ability to the Father. Listen to this. This is uh, John chapter 5 and verse 19. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. The Son can do nothing of himself. And again, that's repeated in this same chapter in the 30th verse where uh, he says, I can of my own self do nothing. So when Jesus says, not I, he is surrendering both his will and his ability to his heavenly father. He is saying, listen to this, this is God in a human body declaring that on this earth he is incapable of doing anything because to function in the spirit realm requires spiritual energy. Now, how could Jesus say that it's not my will and it's not my ability as God and be telling the truth? Well, that's what verses 6 to 8 explain for us. So let's look at it, Philippians chapter 2 and verses 6 to 8. Because when Jesus stepped onto this earth, he emptied himself of some things. What did he empty himself of? Oh, by the way, this chap th th these verses in chapter 2 that we're looking at right now are probably some of the most important verses about the person of Jesus Christ in the entire Bible. You'll note that it says in these verses that uh, 
he made himself, let me get back to the passage, he made himself of no reputation, which translated actually means he emptied himself. And the word translated emptied is a word in the original language, kenosis. And so this is a vital passage. What did Jesus empty himself of? What, what, what is this kenosis all about anyway? Jesus emptied himself of something that caused him to be able to honestly say, I am not able. It's not my ability. It's not my power, but the Father's. In fact, uh, uh, again, I want to jump back for just a, a couple of moments and you listen as I read from John chapter 8 again and verse uh, 28. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He and that I do nothing of myself. That's what He says. In John chapter 12, and verse 49, I'm trying to build a case here. For I have not spoken to myself, Jesus says, but the Father which sent me, and he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Isn't that amazing? Now listen to this. This is chapter 14 of John's Gospel, and verse 10. You're familiar with it. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwells in me, he doeth the works. In other words, what I say and what I do is not from me, but from the Father. So when Jesus stepped on this earth, he emptied himself that enabled him to be able to say, I am not able. I don't have ability. It's my Father's ability. And there are two phases in which Jesus emptied himself. The first phase is he emptied himself, listen to me, as God. I didn't say that he emptied himself of being God, but he emptied himself as God. It says in this verse that, again, verse 6, in the form of God, though he is God, he did not see his deity as something to be clung to. But he made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself and took him upon himself the form of a, a slave made in the likeness of men. As God, Jesus emptied himself. He set aside something. He emptied himself of his reputation. He emptied himself as having the reputation of being God. He veiled the glory of God that he possessed. In fact, you read John's gospel, the very 10th verse, I think, says that he came unto his own, meaning the world, and the world didn't know him. Why? Because his glory as God was purposely veiled. He emptied himself in that way, of no, made himself of no reputation. But not only that, this is even more important. He says <coughs> he emptied himself as God, meaning that he, he set aside, if I can put it that way, the exercise of his deity. When we talk about deity, we're talking about godhood. He set aside the exercise of his deity. Jesus remained God, and he possessed all the attributes of God, but he deliberately set aside, he deliberately emptied himself from using that deity to function on this earth fully as a man. Got that? He didn't empty himself of being God, but he emptied himself of the exercise of deity so that he could function on this planet like you and I, as a human being. That's what it means when it says he made himself of no reputation. He wants to fully identify with you and I. But in verse 8, here is the second way in which he emptied himself. Not only as God, but as a man. It says, 
And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. As a man, Jesus emptied himself. He set aside more. He exchanged his own human will for his father's will. He exchanged his own human ability for his father's ability. Why? So that he could fully identify with you and I as human beings. Because that's a, we, we can't empty ourselves like he did as God, but we are to empty ourselves like he did as humans. That is, as Jesus was fully dependent upon his father's will and ability, power, we are to be fully de uh, dependent upon our Father's will and ability, power in our life through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So, the mind of Christ, what does it look like? It's not I, but the Father. It's that surrender of not I, not my will, not my power. And he emptied himself, he set aside, he set aside these things, he set aside his will, he set aside his ability, and as God, he set aside his reputation, veiled his deity, and the independent exercise of uh, his godhood, his deity. But the second part of Jesus' function on this earth, not only not I, but the Father, and this is important, this is an important balance, and I don't want you to miss it. When he says, not I, he's talking about the surrender of his life. But when he says, but the Father, he's talking about the source of his life. He's talking about the dependence of his life. Because as Jesus emptied the exercise of his deity, and as man emptied his own will and his own power, it caused him to have to be absolutely dependent upon the Father's will and the Father's power through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God activated to energize Jesus' life and ministry from the moment of his conception in the womb of Mary to the offering up of himself on that cross as that uh, sacrifice for us all. In fact, you can read, I'm not going to take the time, Luke chapter 1, and you'll find that he was filled with the Holy Ghost from conception. That child that was formed in her was of the Holy Ghost. And then you find in chapter 2 uh, and verse 52 of Luke, here he is growing as a young, as a child into a young man, and he is developed by the Holy Spirit, having uh, favor with God and with man. In chapter 3 of Matthew's gospel, he's beginning his ministry. He's baptized in the Jordan River of John the, the Immerser. And when he comes up out of that river, remember what happened? The Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, lights upon his head, lands upon his head. And Matthew tells us in chapter 3 and verse 17 that at that moment, Jesus is praying. And if you wonder what he's praying, he recognizes that his baptism uh, is, a, is symbolic of the Spirit's anointing of his ministry, the fulfillment of Isaiah uh, 60. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and hath anointed me, the Messiah, to preach. And so he's praying for the Spirit's anointing there as he comes up out of the water. And then you, you find him, after that, being driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, where he faces Satan head on in that temptation. And he is victorious over Satan, not as God, but as a man. And as a man, he emerges, he came back in the power of the Holy Ghost, we're told, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 14. And even on that cross, I want you to listen to how he uh, paid that sin debt for you and I, not dependent upon himself. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve. Even his, even his death was through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, we are told in Hebrews 9, 14. When Jesus became a man, 
when God stepped down from heaven in the incarnation, God took on all the human limitations that you and I have. And all that Jesus, this is key, I want you to get this. All that Jesus did on this earth, he didn't do as God, but he did it as a man in dependence upon God. And why that's so important is because just like you, he did. And so if you can and you must learn to depend upon the Lord just like Jesus did. Remember, Jesus said, I do nothing of myself. My dependence is upon my Father. And that's what he meant when he said to us in our human life, without me, you can do nothing. As I depended upon my Father, you must depend upon me. You have to live like I lived. This is the mind of Christ, folks. When Jesus was tempted, he became victorious over sin. I'm sure he was tempted to sin more than just as what recorded in Matthew 4, or the Gospels, in that temptation with the devil. I'm sure he faced the Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we are and was victorious. Why? Not because he was God. He was victorious because he depended upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit just like you and I can. And his victory over sin was by faith, by trust, dependence on the Spirit of God. Jesus was on earth and he was God but he functioned as a man, not as God. When Jesus went out to pray, it was because he needed to. He needed to connect with his heavenly Father. He needed to get to the Father. And I'm thinking, if Jesus felt that need, if he had to depend upon the Father for leadership and for power, how much more do you and I need to do that? We need to get to God like he did. And uh, that 12th verse of Philippians 2, wherefore, he says, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. He's not talking about working for salvation, but he's talking about working out in dependence upon God, the salvation that is in you. And he explains that in that 13th verse. He said, for it is God that worketh in you, both to will, that to give you the desire, and to do, to give you the ability or the power to fulfill God's desire. So it's not doing it yourself. It's you depending upon God to do it through you. Now, that's Jesus' mind in verses 6 through 8 explained to us. And if I can just uh, review it again, Jesus' mind is simply this, not I, but the Father. And when he said not I, he's surrendering his life in two specific ways to the Father. Not my will, but your will. Not my power, but your power, your ability. And the explanation of that is in verses 6 through 8, how he emptied himself first as God, he emptied himself by veiling his glory as God. Remember, he lifted the veil a little bit and gave him a glimpse on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? They got a little glimpse of his glory, but that's veiled in his incarnation. He made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself in veiling his glory so that people didn't know. The Jewish leaders, they had no clue that he was the God of heaven. In fact, they accused him of blasphemy every, every time that came up. Why? Because he emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation. He veiled that glory. And then also, as, uh, uh, as God, he refused to exercise his deity. He lived as a human being like you and I have to live. That's so important that we understand that because what's the big deal? If he became a man and he lived a successful human life, if he's depending upon his deity to do that. But he didn't. He depended upon his father. He depended upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
in his life, just like you and I have to. So he functioned on this earth fully as a man, because as a man, he set aside his own will for his father's, and he set aside his own human ability for his father's ability through the Holy Ghost ministry. That's important for us to understand. So let's then apply this to us, because that fifth verse says, let this mind be in you. And that means you. If you're a believer, it means you. It doesn't matter whether we're talking first century or 21st century. If you're a believer, this mind that I just described that Jesus has is to be in you and me. We saw what that looked like this morning already. But for Jesus, that mind, that thinking, that mindset was not I, but the Father. But just as Jesus was in the Father, and the Father in him, now if you're a believer, you're in Christ, and Christ is in you. And so you are to let Christ's mind that is in you be in you, so that it is not I, but Christ. Remember how Paul puts it in Galatians 2.20? I am crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth. Not I, but Christ. That's the mind of Christ. That's what it's about. That's the mindset that we're to have. Reminds me of the missionary Amy Carmichael. She developed a, a burden when she got to India for little girls that were given to the Hindu temple. Now listen, here's what happened back in that day. I think some of it perhaps still is going on. We just don't hear about it as much. <clears throat> in the Hindu religion, when the husband died, the wife, even if she was in perfect health, would, uh, would be burned on a, on a funeral pier with her dead husband, which would leave the children, of course, orphans. The little boys, they could probably, they could, they could find their way. They could, they, they could get work. But the little girls were just, they were given to the Hindu priests. And in the Hindu temple, they were made prostitutes. Well, Amy Carmichael got a burden for those poor little Indian girls. And she went to the Hindu priests to try to rescue them. And she ran up against a brick wall. Those Hindu priests, they went to the Indian businessmen and they said, you got to get this British woman out of here. And the, and the Indian businessmen went to the British businessmen and said, look, this woman is causing trouble. You need to get her out. Well, the British businessmen then went to the British missionaries because she was a British missionary. And they, they told the British missionary, you got to calm this woman down. You have to stop her from the, doing this. And so the British missionaries, they came to uh, Amy and they said, you know, it's unfortunate that it's this way, but it's not our problem. And she was very discouraged by all of this. And she felt like everything was against her. And she went to her room and she got down on her knees by her bed and she began to pray. And she said, Lord, I've done all I could, but it hasn't helped. And I give up. And it's your problem. It's not my problem anymore. Amy suddenly saw Jesus. He was kneeling not under an olive tree, but under an Indian tamarind tree. And she saw tears streaming down Jesus' face. And he looked at her and he said, that's right, Amy. It's not your problem. It's not your burden. It's my problem. It's my burden but I'm looking for someone who will help me bear it. And she went back to work and she rescued hundreds of these little girls. And uh, that's basically what Jesus is looking for. That's what the mind of Christ is. He's looking for someone like you to co-labor with him. Did you know you're called a co-laborer with God? He's looking for you and I to co-labor with him in making disciples. But you know what? I've discovered this. Apart from the Holy Spirit, you and I will never care for anyone but ourselves. Let me repeat that. Apart from the Holy Spirit working in us and developing the mind of Christ in us, 
none of us will ever care about anyone but ourselves. That's just the way it is. That's the way we live. That's why we need the mind of Christ to think like Jesus thinks. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will just cause the truth of all of this to hit home. Maybe overwhelming to us. Lord, what lengths you went to because you didn't care about yourself. You gave yourself up totally. And that same mindset is supposed to be ours. So often, it's the opposite. It's just the natural, selfish, worldly mentality, looking out for number one. And number one isn't you, it's ourselves. And we're, all, oh, we're just concerned about ourselves and our family. We're not really as much concerned about anyone else. It's evident, Lord, in the way that we conduct ourselves, how that we really don't go out of our way to do anything more than we have to. Lord, I don't, we don't want to fail you like this. We don't want to, Lord, based upon what you've done for us, how in the world can we justify saving our lives being lifesavers in that sense. Because we certainly are the losers if we protect ourselves. We protect ourselves from people penetrating the wall that we set up so that we can protect our little space. And as a result, we're far from the mind of Christ. We're full of our own mind. We're full of our self-centeredness. Lord, tear those walls down there's something worse than the Berlin Wall that needs to be torn down. And Lord, I would say to myself and I would say to this congregation, anyone else that's listening, tear down those walls. Lord, tear down the wall of self-interest, of self-centeredness in our lives, we pray. Begin that destruction process with intensity even today. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's sing a closing number.